Hi, my name is Rick Duncan. I'm a retired pastor, and in my career, I've had a number of different roles. Before this, for 14 years, I was the senior pastor at Carmel Presbyterian Church. Before that, 17 years in Brazil as a missionary training pastors, and before that, five years at San Clemente Presbyterian Church as a youth pastor. Today, I'm pretty much most excited about my role as a grandpa, and you'll hear a little bit about that later. I'm also part of the church planting committee of our presbytery here, and a lot of exciting things are going on in that. I'd like to share with you a little bit. Eco is really trying to become a church planting movement. This is a picture of Gio, Indra, Matias, and Sofia, the Garcia family, who are from Colombia, and we are working with them to develop a church a network of Spanish-speaking churches here in the LA area. We're working with another presbytery at the same time. Very exciting. We're hoping that Gio and a few eco-pastors like him will be able to recruit, train, and launch dozens of leaders who will plant house churches, some of which, which will continue as house churches with those advantages, and some of which will become larger churches like this one that are able to serve all the different needs of a young family. Our goal in ECO is to plant 600 churches by 2030. And as a former missionary, I am especially excited that we think a lot of those churches are initially, initially going to be not in English. They're not going to be predominantly English-speaking congregations. Now, I'm grateful to be part of ECO and to have a role as a volunteer in this movement. Uh, if you're interested, contact me. It's exciting, and we are going to need hundreds of people to pray and to help with administrative details and to give financially, even to be part of church planting teams. I know that True Light has planted churches in the past, and I think that's a big part of your legacy. Well, that's my introduction of myself. On to today's message. Today, we are going to be considering what is arguably one of the richest passages in the entire Bible, the first 11 verses of chapter 5 of the book of Romans. I love this passage. I know you're currently in the book of Galatians. The book of Romans is often considered kind of a companion to Galatians, Galatians being a briefer explanation of the gospel, Romans being considered by scholars the most robust, uh, most complete, longest explanation of the gospel in the Bible. So I hope that today's message will supplement what you're doing in Galatians, perhaps give you something in addition to that. Well, I want you to think for a minute, have you ever daydreamed about finding a real treasure map? I daydreamed about that a lot as a child. I had read Edgar Allan Poe's The Gold Bug, and I thought that was exciting. So it's not too surprising that one of my favorite movies from 1985 is Goonies. Now, in Goonies, there are four 13-year-old boys who they're about to lose their homes because a developer is coming in and their families can't afford their homes, and they find a treasure map in the attic, and they go on this wild adventure. Some high schoolers join them, and they go underground. They have to figure out clues. They're chased by criminals. They find a pirate ship and this amazing uh, treasure that ends up saving their home. So it's very exciting. I love that. And Jesus thought about treasure. He said, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and then covered up and then went and sold all that he had and bought that field with joy. Now, in many ways, I see the book of Romans as a treasure map. God inspired the Apostle Paul to describe for us how to find and acquire what is arguably the most valuable treasure in the universe. And Romans 5 for us today will, will display several aspects of that treasure. Now, as you listen to the first 11 verses of chapter 5, would you try to note Paul's enthusiasm as he says phrases like, not only so, much more, more than that. And would you notice Paul's immediacy as he uses the word now three times to tell us how positive our current situation is? And then thirdly, Paul's joy as he will use the word rejoice three times and see if you can pick up on what he's saying is our motive for rejoicing. Romans 5, verses 1 through 11. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access 
to this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of sharing the glory of God. More than that, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit which has been given to us. While we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Why, one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for a good man one will dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Since, therefore, we are now justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. Not only so, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received our reconciliation. Well, as I said, super rich text, lots there. We're not going to cover everything, and I just really want to give you some nuggets that have helped me for years. The first is we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Now, I want to clarify that the word hope in our current culture does not mean at all the same thing that hope means in the New Testament almost always. In our culture, we think, oh, I, I hope my team wins the Super Bowl, or I hope this person I'm attracted to will want to go out with me, or I hope I'll win the lottery, or I hope against hope. It, hope in our culture uh, is used to denote uncertainty, and usually less than, sometimes less than likely. Hope in the New Testament is certain. I often suggest that people, instead of using the word hope, when they read it in the New Testament, they read certain hope, or certain hope and promise. Hope in the New Testament is very much like a promise. So Paul says we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. But what is the glory of God? Why do we rejoice in it? Explaining the glory of God, and I'll do the best I can, but it's much like trying to explain to someone what chocolate tastes like when they've never tasted chocolate. Now, some people like Moses and Paul, they had visions and they had a taste of God's glory and his presence. And some people today have experienced God's presence supernaturally in ways that they've had a taste of God's glory. But even those who have experienced that little bit have never experienced what it means to be immersed in God's glory. Immersion in God's glory in the next life will overwhelm us. It will fill us with wonder and awe. In God's presence, his goodness, his beauty, his power, his love, they, they emanate out. They're, they're pulpable. They're overwhelming, so much so that we, we couldn't handle them right now, but we will be able to later. And like trying to describe how chocolate tastes, uh, if you've ever supernaturally experienced God's presence through the power of the Holy Spirit, imagine that a thousand times more. If you're deeply moved by the beauty of, of a symphony or a sunset, that's only a taste. If you are the kind of person that goes to a football or soccer game and, and just gets caught up with 100,000 people in the cheering and the, the glory of that, that's but a snippet. If you've ever experienced an earthquake in California, of course, and felt that power, it will be much more than that. If you've ever been infatuated deeply and just head over heels in love or experienced the love of your children or your grandchildren, imagine that magnified many times. Now, these, I use them just because they are some of the most moving experiences we have in this life where we see through a mirror dimly, but in the next life, face to face, we experience God's glory in snippets and tastes in this life, but in the next life, it will be overwhelming. When I was a child, I really looked forward to Christmas and the things I, were, I was going to receive. Now, I look forward to experiencing the glory of God and how overwhelming and magnificent that will be.
So I try to remind myself daily that all of the wonderful experiences, magnificent experiences of this life are just mere tastes, samples, like Costco samples of what we have been promised. We will experience the glory of God. It's not a vague hope, it's a promise. The glory of God is a great treasure. It is a greater experience than anything else the universe has to offer. And the map to that treasure is here in Romans that we need to believe in Jesus Christ, that he lived the perfect life we all fail to live. He died the death in my place, in our place that we deserve. And then he rose from the dead in victory. And we put our faith in him so that now, Paul says, we are justified. We are forgiven. We are reconciled. We are adopted into God's very own family. And these are amazing treasures that we inherit. Well, let's go on to the middle part of our text. After saying we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God, Paul says, not only more than that, we rejoice in our sufferings. Now, that sounds really strange, especially to uh, us in our current culture. We like pleasure, not suffering. We rejoice when things are going well, not when we're in pain. In Tim Keller's book, Walking with God Through Pain and Suffering, he states that our American culture has failed to prepare us for suffering more than just about any other culture throughout history. We don't expect to suffer. He explains that biblical Christianity offers more help and uh, a fuller worldview when we suffer. So I highly recommend the book. But let's look at just a, a few things about this in the time we have today. So how can Paul say we rejoice in our sufferings? Many people, when they hear that, they go, well, Paul just doesn't know. He, where does he get off telling me that? I, I've suffered so much, I can't possibly rejoice in that. That makes no sense whatsoever. Paul just does not understand what I've been through. Well, 2 Corinthians chapter 11 it lists Paul's sufferings. He'd been imprisoned multiple times. He'd received 39 lashes five times. He'd been beaten with rods three times. He'd been stoned and left for dead. He'd been uh, shipwrecked, hungry, cold, and betrayed. Of all the apostles, he probably suffered the most. But he learned to make the most of his sufferings and to even rejoice in them. You may remember in Acts chapter 16, when Paul goes to Philippi and he is unjustly beaten and thrown into prison where his legs are spread apart painfully in stocks, and he's probably lying in the dirt with blood coming out of his wounds, and he and Silas pray and sing and rejoice in God. And God sends an earthquake, and the doors of the prison open, and the chains fall off, and the and the Philippian jailer hears the gospel from Paul, and he and his family become followers of Jesus. Sometimes suffering is God wants to reach others, as in that particular case. So when Paul talks about suffering and what it leads to, I want to share with you some thoughts that I find helpful for myself. Perhaps they'll help you. He, he mentions sort of like a link between suffering and endurance, and character, and hope, and God's love that leads us to rejoicing. So what I like to do, what's helpful to me, I do something that I call the chain of blessing, and we'll put it up on the screen. When suffering comes into our lives, if we cooperate with the Holy Spirit, then looking back usually, we can see how that suffering produced endurance in us. And then we can see how that changed the way we are, our character, and what we expect, and what we believe, and that character then is a link connected to hope, a certain hope in the promises of God. And when we have that, God then supernaturally promises to pour his love into our hearts. And then when we see all of that and look back, we rejoice. We rejoice that God has turned the tables on the evil done to us by bringing us into a stronger relationship with him. Now, please don't misunderstand me and don't misunderstand Paul. No one is saying that evil is good. Paul is saying that God is so powerful that even when people did all these different evil things to him, God was able to turn the tables on evil and bring good out of it. It's much like what we read later on in Romans, Romans 8, 28. We know that in everything God works for good 
with those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. There are lots of examples of this. Joseph in the Old Testament, many other things. The, the best example probably throughout all of history is Jesus' death on the cross. Nothing so vile, nothing so sinful has ever been perpetrated by human beings. It was Satan inspiring and cooperating with humans to crucify the Son of God. And initially, the disciples saw this and they just, oh, it's over, we're done, evil has won. But then Jesus is resurrected on Sunday. And we find that what was the most evil thing ever done by humans becomes the biggest blessing of all time as Jesus' sufferings in our place redeem us, get a, earn us forgiveness, and bring us into reconciliation with God. So God turned the worst thing into the greatest blessing, and he wants to do that with us as well. Now, I'm going to share with you some things you can think about when you've suffered. Most of us are not as mature as Paul, so I don't recommend that in the middle of your bereavement or being betrayed or being diagnosed with cancer, you probably won't immediately be able to go to these questions that I'm going to give you. And you probably don't want to go to someone who's suffering and suggest that they use these questions. But when you have a little distance, uh, maybe even if you're able to do it in the middle of it, I would recommend that you think about these 10 questions I'll give you as you work through your suffering and try to come to the place of rejoicing. So these are 10 questions that I use for myself when I'm, when I'm suffering. First is one that throughout history, Christians have kind of often dwelt on. It, it's similar to Job's, um, the, Job's comforters, supposedly. And it's often not the case, but we still need to bring it up. And that is, is there some kind of a blatant sin that I need to repent of? Second, is there some obvious character quality that God is trying to produce in me? Or am I clinging to something too much and God wants to use the suffering to get me to let go? Can my suffering, if nothing else, help me to appreciate and be grateful for the suffering of Jesus on the cross or in this life? Can my suffering help me to help others when they're suffering, to have more empathy and come alongside them? Am I, in the midst of my suffering, praying that I will have the kind of attitude that will attract others to Jesus? Is my suffering increasing my hope and interest in the next life? As Paul said, we hope in the glory of God. Is the Holy Spirit filling me with a stronger experience of God's love, as it says here in Romans 5, that God's love is poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, which has been given to us. Am I actually rejoicing in the midst of the suffering because of that experience of God's love? And then finally, something that we will hit the 10th thing at the end of the sermon. Is the suffering showing that I actually love God for himself and not just for the benefits I receive from him. I hope something in there helps you. We want to proactively collaborate with the Holy Spirit as we overcome suffering and rejoice. One of my favorite quotes about how our belief in God redeems even our suffering is from Dostoevsky. It's a long quote, but bear with me. I believe like a child that suffering will be healed and made up for. That all the humiliating absurdity of human contradictions will vanish like a pitiful mirage. Like the despicable fabrication of the impotent and infinitely small Euclidean mind of man. That in the world's finale, at the moment of eternal harmony, something precious will come to pass that, will, that it will suffice for all hearts, for the comforting of all resentments, for the atonement of all the crimes of humanity, of all the blood that they've shed, 
that it will make it not only possible to forgive, but to justify all that has happened. Dostoevsky. Again, a very rich passage. I want to now take you through some thoughts on the final section. Let's look at it again. While we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. A woman will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for a good man, one will dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Since, therefore, we are now justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life. Not only so, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received our reconciliation. So it was while we were sinners, not pursuing God, that he showed his love for us, for you. His sacrifice, his blood saves us from the wrath of God. While we were enemies, we were reconciled to God. And now that we are not enemies, but with him, his children, Jesus lives to make intercept, intersection, to intercede for us. And then we rejoice in God, it says at the end. Now, Paul is enthusiastically expressing just how redeemed we are. Now we have been saved. Now we are reconciled. Now we have reconciliation. Because he wants you to understand this is not something for later. This is right now to have a relationship with God. Now, it's true. We see through a mirror dimly. It's true that we have sometimes more powerful experiences of the Holy Spirit than others. But now we are reconciled, forgiven, justified, able to have this relationships. Now, for me, it is somewhat of a daily struggle to constantly remind myself just how much God loves me. See, like many humans, I would really prefer to earn my salvation. I want to make God proud of me so that I can be proud of myself uh, to be good enough to please God. And the fact is, no one is. So in an effort to be proud of myself, I will find myself worrying about my performance and this, that, or the other thing. I'm sure some of you can relate to that, maybe not all. But the gospel in Galatians and Romans means that I am now justified, forgiven, reconciled to God. Instead of trying to earn it, I get to receive it and experience it as the Holy Spirit floods into my life and pours God's love into my heart. So after being very enthusiastic about our current state of being forgiven and reconciled to God, Paul says, not only so, but we also rejoice in God. Now, people did not love their gods in the ancient world. This is somewhat revolutionary because gods weren't filled with goodness. Gods were often capricious and, and lied and self-serving and they didn't die for their enemies to adopt them into their families. They were strong and victorious according to what they understood the gods to be. And uh, you bargained with them. You tried to see if you could get them to do something for you, but you did not love them. You were not overwhelmed with gratitude for their goodness and their, the way that they were self-sacrificing. But you see, the true God is filled with love and goodness and sacrifices his only son in order to be reconciled, to reconcile his enemies to himself. Our God, the only true God, is so worthy of our admiration, our awe, our gratitude, our love. This next picture shows you my, my six grandchildren. The seventh one is due next week. They bring an incredible amount of just joy and love and excitement and energy into my life. One of the wonderful things about being a grandpa is that it is helping me to understand how God loves me. I think that God has hardwired parental and grandparent love 
into our being so that we are better at understanding how he loves us. Let me explain. Now, I loved these children profoundly since about the time they were born. I've been able to watch them grow. They have amazing potential. They bring such energy and excitement. And the wonderful thing is, they love me back. But I don't say to the three-year-old, come on, Janelle, you're three now. Go out and get a job. Help with the family finances. Why are you still acting like a toddler? Grow up. I believe God has given this experience to me to help me understand that he delights in me, that he loved me while I was still a sinner, that even more now that I have this relationship with him, that I'm reconciled, he delights in me. In John 15, Jesus says, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. Well, how did the Father love the Son? He said, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. I would urge you, and I'm urging myself, to stop each day and realize that that is how God sees you. That he looks through the imputed righteousness of Christ when he looks at you. And it fills him with delight. He forgives your sins and he sees the magnificent, glorious person you are going to become when you are finally transformed completely into the image of Jesus Christ. He knows that spiritually you're currently a lot like a toddler, like a three-year-old, at least I am. But he dotes on you even more than I dote on my grandchildren. Now, perhaps that's the word you need most today, to deeply believe that God delights in you, that you cannot earn his love, but you can experience through the whole, it through the Holy Spirit and you can receive it. Can you rejoice at this amazing, self-sacrificing God who is filled with beauty and goodness and loves you so much? Part of being made in the image of God is that we want to be loved for ourselves and not just because we do things for people. And similarly, God wants you to love him for who he is, to actually rejoice in God for himself. The greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart and your soul and your mind and your strength. One of the opportunities suffering brings is to see if we love God for himself or only when things are going well, only because of what he gives us. Just as my grandchildren fill me with delight by loving me back, may you love God back. May you rejoice in our beautiful, good, loving, powerful, glorious God. May you rejoice that he supernaturally pours his love into your heart, even in the midst of suffering. May you rejoice as you eagerly wait for the experience of his glory, much like I wait for Christmas, used to. Rejoice in God. Love him back. That is what he wants. Amen. You have shown us, O oh God, what is good. You have shown us, O oh what you require You have heard all our songs How we long to worship you Yet you told us The offering you desire Oh
May God bless you in every way. May you be filled with anticipation and excitement as you wait for the experience of the glory of God. May the Holy Spirit pour God's love into your heart in the midst of any pain that you're going through. And may you revel in this God who died for you when you were still his enemy and love him back for who he is. Go in peace. Go in the power of the Holy Spirit. Go with this God who loves you so much. Amen. I hope Pastor Duncan's message today from Romans 5 encourages you and that uh, also that you were able to make the connection that he made between Romans and Paul's letter to the Galatians, uh, which we will be coming back to in a few Sundays. Please make sure today that you uh, look at connections and uh, see the information about what is going on in our church fellowship, about all that is happening, and especially uh, notice the announcement about our English ministry prayer gathering on Wednesday evening at 7.30, and the uh, Zoom info that you need to join us in prayer on Wednesday evening uh, can be found there on Connections. We have a long anticipated announcement that we would like to make today. Uh, Beginning on Sunday, July 4th, uh, our church building is going to be reopened again for in-person worship services. Now that's gonna be worship services only. There won't be any other activities in the building uh, just yet. Uh, Be looking in connections uh, for the scheduling and so forth, but when you do see it, you'll notice that our Cantonese ministry will be worshiping beginning at 9 a.m., our Mandarin ministry at 10.30, and then the English ministry at 12 noon. Also in connections, be looking for other guidelines and protocol from our reopening committee that uh, we'll all need to be uh, taking uh, into account as we come back together again for worship. But uh, today we just wanted to announce this news and uh, we, uh, we thank God for our reopening committee and for this uh, decision and we're just so looking forward to welcoming you all back on Sunday, July 4th. 
，重新開放我哋嘅教會嚟到喺教會嚟到實體崇拜。咁呢個崇拜咧係喺七月四號開始。咁我哋嘅時間咧就係粵語堂嘅係九點鐘朝早，國語堂咧係十點半，英語堂係十二點。暫時我哋只係開放教會嘅崇拜，其他嘅教會嘅活動咧都暫時未開放。但係我哋感謝主，我哋終於可以開放啦！請大家，我哋繼續留意群組，我哋需要一啲注意嘅開放之後嘅誒參與崇拜嘅事項。咁我哋好感謝主，有人咧俾我哋可以終於嚟到翻翻嚟到教會崇拜。我哋歡迎大家喺七月四號，我哋翻翻嚟教會嚟到參加我哋嘅主日崇拜。弟兄姐妹，主內平安。今天要報告給大家一個特別的好消息，關於我們教會啊重新開放在室內聚會的事項。我们教会经过长期的重启委员会的讨论，决定在七月四号的主日，我们将要啊全面的开放我们三个堂的啊在主日的聚会。粤语堂聚会的时间是早晨九点。国语堂是十点半，英文堂是十二点。关于重启事工的进一步的事项呢，请大家关注我们教会的网站和各个介绍的事工。我们今天在这里呢，独单独要向大家报告这项事工呢，是特别的向神献上感恩，终于使我们教会能够重新回到教会来崇拜，也谢谢弟兄姐妹长期以来为教会重启。起的祷告，欢迎大家在七月四号一起回到教会来同心敬拜神，感谢赞美神，也谢谢大家。Keep it all in prayer. Thank you. 我哋继续祷告，多谢。请为这个重启施工继续祷告，谢谢。